All right, great. Well, um, we have had the pleasure of having Dr. Sin our, as our guest speaker several times in the past in person, which is was always lots of fun. Yeah. And then uh, she agreed to join us, I think it was last year, to talk about mm -hmm. abnormal avian behavior. And that recording is actually on our website. So um, if you want to go back and listen to that, that would be helpful. Um, you know, developing relationships with our animals or our humans companions is always uh, takes some work and some effort. And the fact that you're here today and willing to put some effort into building that relationship with your bird is really, really wonderful. And hopefully um, we'll be able to address not only the things that become problems, but get ahead of those problems. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> so I know Dr. Sin is very busy. Another reason we're so grateful that she's with us today because everybody's got those behavior issues that they're trying to tackle. So thank you again for being here today, Dr. Sin, and our attendees who want to do a better job of living successfully in a positive way with their, with their animal companions. So I'm going to go off video and thanks again. I'll let you take it away. All righty. Thank you very much, Ann. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time to join us um, on, on what is, at least in our, on the East Coast here, a rather lovely um, Saturday afternoon. I appreciate your time. Um, we are going to go ahead and, uh, well, I hope, if we can get this to advance, let's see here. Uh, There we go. Um, talk a little bit about avian avian behavior. Um, before I dive in, just a little little bit about myself. I am a, a veterinarian, and I am board certified, meaning that I have specialized in in behavior. Uh, my practice is located in Northern Virginia, and I see a variety of different animals, different species, um, parrots being one of them but also critters like rabbits, uh, pot-bellied pigs, cats, dogs, horses, a whole, a whole variety of, of animals. Um, parrots are near and dear to my heart. I've um, had a number of different parrots over the course of, of my life, um, and I find them absolutely and, uh, uh, fascinating in an, in an unlimited sense. Their, their behaviors are uh, mesmerizing. So I hope this will provide you with some additional information that you will find to be useful. Today's focus is going to be on normal uh, parrot behavior. As Anne mentioned, I did a presentation a year or so ago on, on abnormal behavior, so please refer to that if you would need some further uh, information on how things can can go off the rails with with our parrot companions. Um, but today we're going to focus on the normal aspects of their behavior. And you'll find that it's extremely important or, or extremely critical to have that because it provides a baseline knowledge about what is um, typical. I guess that's the best way to put it uh, of our parrot companions. Um, and what to expect, how to best interact with them, and, and honestly, how to address those needs. Parrot ownership is not anything new. Parrots have been popular uh, as pets for many, many decades. I just have a sampling here of, of some of the well-known, more recent celebrities that are parrot owners. I'm sure everyone recognizes Chevy Chase there. On the on the left, um, and Liz Taylor uh, on the at the top there, in an iconic photograph. And then probably not all of you will recognize the gentleman there, the young man there at the bottom. But that is actually Teddy Roosevelt uh, with his macaw, um, Eli Yale. So even our presidents have a, a love and an interest in parrots. Some key points to keep in mind as we go through this information and as we have a chance to ch chat, we want to talk about the difference between domestication um, and, and tameness. So 
parrots are not domesticated species. Domesticated species are animals that have been selected literally over thousands of generations by humans uh, to have greater tolerance for people. Parrots, on the other hand, are tame, meaning over time they've become used to or accustomed to people uh, versus having that selection process or that genetic push towards being tolerant. So that makes a big difference in their responses and their ability to tolerate uh, our human idiosyncrasies. They are prey animals um, being kept in captivity, which in and of itself is extremely stressful for them. Yeah. And these parrots are different species, meaning they are individual, um, intact, special uh, animals in and of themselves versus breeds. So just as an example, uh, in dogs, there are some 400 plus breeds of dogs, ranging from the now extremely popular French Bulldog to the obscure Otter Hound. But they are all dogs. When we talk about macaws versus uh, kikes versus cockatiels versus um, uh, lovebird, they are distinct and separate species, um, meaning that they cannot interbreed, or in most situations cannot interbreed and, um, and are unique in and of themselves. What reason why that is so important is because each individual species will have very specific species needs and requirements for that particular type. So important to keep in mind, um, there are, as of the last time I looked, um, 352 different species of parrots out there in the world. So that's a lot of specific information that needs to be sorted through um, in terms of knowing what your particular parrot may or may not need in its environment and in terms of its care. Selection, when it does occur, uh, within our parrot species tends to be for appearance and not for behavior. So I just had this photo up here to demonstrate some different uh, color morphs in these, in these lovebirds. So in general, uh, they are prey animals. They uh, tend to have very social behavior, often exhibited and the way that most people can think about this as a flock behavior means that because of their socialness, they have complex interactions uh, with conspecifics and they are foragers, meaning that they go out and about searching for food. And this takes up an enormous part of their time and their effort. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about time budgets here as we move through this talk. So how does this affect care and how, why is this important to know this basic background information? Well, because our parents retain their natural behaviors and instincts. This is part of who they are. This is how they, how they behave and it impacts how we need to interact with them and manage them day to day. One of the barriers that we're dealing with, or hurdles, if you will, is that there are very, very few scientific studies associated with the behavior of these species. We just finished saying 352 different parrot species. There are not uh, 352 different studies of behavior um, as far as parrots are concerned. So what this means is there are huge gaps in our knowledge uh, about what these parrots need. As I mentioned, because of their prey animals being held in, in confinement, uh, they're very, very subject to stress. And we need to do everything in our power to mitigate that, that stress. We need to acknowledge that they are being held in an abnormal uh, setup, an abnormal um, environment, and we have to do um, 
go above and beyond in order to try and mitigate some of that stress. And unfortunately, like it or not, <laughs> many of those natural behaviors that they intrinsically exhibit are not particularly suited to captivity. Um, again, refer to that abnormal behavior talk that we that I alluded to, but most of those behaviors are normal behaviors, but unwanted behaviors because of their captive situation. So they can be difficult to impact. Um, it's often better wherever ab we're able to do so to mitigate, prevent, um, um, help them in any way that we can to keep, to keep those normal behaviors from veering, veering into the abnormal. Uh, here are some examples about how that applies. Um, the, the parents can be easily stressed by normal day-to-day -day activities. There's a, a pretty um, brilliant study that was done at UC of Davis associated with Orange Wing Amazon that showed that Amazons are being kept in, in their aviary situation that were housed closest to the entrance and exit door for the facility were more likely to show abnormal repetitive behaviors than those birds that were housed towards the back of the facility away from the exit. So the implication was that just the act of people coming and going was stressful to the birds which is um, something to think about. They can hide illnesses and medical conditions very, very well. Again, that, that is part of their, of their normal adaptive behavior, but it sure doesn't help us as caregivers for these animals if they are able to hide the fact that they are sick. I mentioned that many of the behaviors, natural behaviors, uh, are not necessarily abnormal but they are certainly unwanted. So things like uh, screaming, calling, biting, chewing, um, those are all completely normal behaviors for parrots, but for some reason, people don't appreciate those in, in their home. They can veer into the, into the realm of being maladaptive uh, when they happen persistently, consistently, it all has to do with the severity of the behavior, the frequency of the behavior, the intensity of the behavior as to whether or not we start to worry about them um, being maladaptive. So one of the things that I wanted to zero in on is their sensor behavior and the unit that composes a good part of their social behavior is, uh, is their flock. And I wanted to give a shout out here. Many of the pictures of these beautiful parrot interactions are actually uh, courtesy of the World Parrot Trust. If you have not gone to their website or aren't familiar with that organization, definitely um, an organization or group that you should check out. Um, I will have a little bit more information on them further into the talk. So flocks are composed of uh, complex groups uh, of birds. The purpose of a flock primarily uh, composes four main things. They help to decrease predation pressure on individuals. So yes, clearly a flock can be um, a source of interest to predators, but the risk for any one individual is reduced or spread out throughout the, the flock. Because of the help of, uh, of conspecifics in terms of foraging, in terms of decreasing predation, in terms of overseeing and protecting territory, it improves the reproductive success of individuals within that group or flock. The flock's going to help with foraging, basically cooperation, meaning that if you've got more eyes on the ground or eyes in the trees, if you will, it's easier to spot food, uh, locate resources. And depending on the species that we're talking about, the flock may also contribute to occupying and protecting territory. The flocks function by uh, traveling to different sites, uh, searching for food, locating those resources. 
Again, because you've got multiple individuals participating, you're going to have improved efficiency in locating food and resources, that safety for the flock members. Um, the size of the flock is going to vary associated with uh, the species involved and the food source. So if it is a, a group, a nomadic group, for example, like um, uh, parakeets or cockatiels, often birds that are found in arid regions, they're going to travel as a large group um, because that allows them to see uh, resources spread out that are that are harder to find as an individual. If the food is localized uh, in a in a single uh, close area, for example, uh, fruit trees, uh, then the group size may actually be smaller because you don't need huge numbers of individuals individuals spread out over large spaces in order to locate that food. There's often a, a cyclical pattern associated with the flock that alternates uh, resting and feeding. So we'll talk about how that unfolds a little bit more clearly in the next couple of slides, but basically uh, alternating active periods with, with resting periods. And here's a, some beautiful, a beautiful uh, red-fronted parakeets actively foraging. So the cyclical activity that I mentioned or alluded to, the birds normally start to become active with the rising sun. So at, at sunrise, they start to groom, they start to vocalize, <laughs> there's uh, interactions with their, their cohort uh, before they decide as a group, as a flock to go forth and forage. As I mentioned, depending on the species and, de and depending on the, the food source, they may separate out into smaller feeding flocks. In general, if they're in a climate where it gets quite warm uh, during the middle of the day, they may settle and rest during the peak period of heat, um, but then go back out and start foraging again in the afternoon um, all the way up to the point where sunset begins to occur. And as the light decreases, they may then gather back into a large roosting flock. During the evening is when a large amount of social interaction takes place. And obviously being in a group helps them, again, with the many eyes to keep um, alert for predators and let other members of the crowd of the group, <laughs> the flock, know if there's any danger. So it helps with, um, with safety of the members. Here's a, some, a lovely group of mitered conyers. So here's a time allocation. Again, remember, 350 some different species of parrots. This is not specific uh, for, for a particular kind of parrot, nor is it completely applicable to all parrots in general. This is just a rough estimate, if you will, compiled from a number of different studies um, about time allocation for parrots. So to give you just a rough idea, about 20 to 60% of their time will be spent in grooming themselves or a conspecific. About 40 to 60% of their time is spent foraging, so out and about actively seeking food. Two to 5% of their time is spent vocalizing. Um, there's going to be social interaction going on about 10 to 40% of the time. So lots of interactions with their flock mates. And in general, these parrots have a, a sleep budget of about 10 to 12 hours. So they are actively resting, sleeping for 10 to 12 hours a day. So that gives you an idea of how that time, that 24 hour period is, is divided. 
So think about it. They need 10 to 12 hours of active sleep, and they're going to need about, um, they're going to have about 12 hours that it's divided out amongst this grooming, foraging, vocalizing, and social interactions. Huge amount of time is spent foraging, and a huge amount of time is spent in uh, social interactions, of which part of that is um, self-grooming or um, mutual grooming. Uh, a lot of questions about hierarchy. Uh, is there a hierarchy that, that um, influences their interactions with people? I mean, how does that work? Well, behaviorally speaking, hierarchies are very important amongst <laughs> members of the same species because they prevent aggression from happening. It decreases the risk of injury um, and helps to prevent uh, actually overt aggression. So if everybody knows what their place is within the group, then the chance of active overt aggression is decreased. So hierarchy is important. Hierarchy is established. And again, the purpose is to, to decrease wear and tear on, on everyone. It, it supports those predictable interactions. And what the hierarchy does is it determines access to things like mates, um, roosting spots or nesting sites, and, and access to food uh, as well. Um, so it is important within the flock, but we don't have any research or to, to speak of looking at how that hierarchy plays out between species. Um, I've listed a couple of references uh, down at the bottom, uh, papers that I've looked at. And again, remember that the hierarchy is primarily a concern, primarily important between conspecifics, so other, with other parrots of the same species versus a uh, hierarchy being something that we worry about between people and parrots. Um, here's just a, a fun interaction here between the two, um, two macaws. Birds, the parrots are really excellent in terms of behaviors that they exhibit towards each other to let the other birds know um, what it is that they are thinking, proposing, um, how they feel about something. Then the lists that I provide here are actually all based off of cockatiels, which is a study that was done by Cole Davis uh, at the University of Georgia. And we've got a, a list of behaviors that were felt to be um, assertive and a list of behaviors that were felt to be submissive. So this is what is referred to or um, labeled as an ethogram. So a, a kind of a, a behavioral dictionary, if you will, uh, that defines different behaviors, uh, what they look like and what their intent is. Again, this is just for cockatiels. And again, remember 352 species. Do we have ethograms for, for most of the parrot species out there? No, we do not. Again, the research has not been done, but this allows us at least a place to start um, and the beginning of a way to be able to interpret what it is that we are seeing. So here's a African gray. Uh, ruffled feathers, leaning forward, not necessarily pleased with whomever he's got that directed at. Remember, uh, parrots have um, musculoskeletal muscles in the, in the pupils of their eyes, which means that they can consciously constrict and dilate the eye by choice. And they often use this as a way to signal whether or not they are happy <laughs> or unhappy uh, with the interaction that is taking place. Um, most often, it's an indication of their level of stimulation, um, arousal, not necessarily from a sexual standpoint, just how 
um, stimulated they are um, when they're going in to interact or when they're about to interact. Uh, wing flapping, elevation of the crest, pupil dilation. And in this case, you can see the cockatoo is leaning back or away. So he's, he's worried or concerned. And then this, I had to put this in here. I, it's a little bit off screen, but hopefully you can see it. Um, it this is a, a parrot responding to having his head scratched by his person um, and enjoying it fully with his eyes closed, leaning in into the, to the scratching. Um, clearly having a good time. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in learning more about parrot body language, uh, I could certainly advocate for Barbara Heidenreich's um, videos, webinars, uh, books, and information on parrot body language. That is certainly a really good place to start. A little bit about diet, what they eat, and how they go about obtaining it. Remember that huge chunk of time in, their, in the general time budget devoted to foraging behavior. So up to 60% of the 12 hours allotted to them uh, during daylight hours, they're going to be out and about foraging. They are opportunistic foragers, meaning that they will take advantage of uh, resources, food sources within their environment. They enjoy a variety of foods such as seeds and nuts and fruits of different kinds. Because of the amount of ground distance that they have to cover, they have high energy requirements in those situations. They have to have enough fuel right, to be able to um, do the flight that's required to forage. Again, because there's so many different species, some birds do have more specialized feeding requirements. Some may be actually consuming sources of protein, such as insects. One of the parrots that's quite unusual is the um, uh, Kia, the New Zealand parrot, they actually will eat carrion as well. So anything dead that they come across. Lorries and lorikeets have specialized diets associated with uh, fruits or nectar uh, from various plants <clears throat> and sources. And in some situations, <laughs> some birds will also take advantage of agricultural crop crops um, and seasonal variation. I just pulled information on one particular species, just kind of as an FYI, the scarlet macaw. And during a study of that particular species with direct observation by biologists, they were able to identify, uh, again, with that one study, 43 um, different plant species that contributed to the bird's diet. So that will give you an idea of the variety that these uh, parrots access um, and the amount of foraging and distance that they cover in order to be able to meet those dietary needs. And uh, this was just a spectacular photograph that I thought you all would enjoy. It is a lorikeet um, eating a fruit source. And I have to admit, I do not even know what kind of a fruit this is. Um, I'm not an expert in, in, um, <laughs> in fruit, fruit trees from uh, Papua New Guinea, but that'll give you, give you an idea. How about uh, reproduction and courtship behaviors of various kind? Well, they do have very set, set ritualized courtship behaviors that they in, indulge in. Um, involves a fair number of display features. 
Some parrots actually have uh, courtship songs that they utilize. So vocalization is part of that ritualized courtship behavior. Most of our parrots uh, have um, what's called serial monogamy. So they, they form a pair bond that lasts uh, for the length of the breeding season. But because there's so many different species, there are actually many different uh, mating strategies that parrots use, de again, depending on the species, um, including um, territorial um, um, mating strategies where a pair may hold an actual territory and going all the way over to the other end of the spectrum with cooperative uh, systems like monk um, parakeets that, monk parrots that um, are colonial breeders and, and, and join together in the formation of the, of the nest and um, in, a, in a colonial manner. The pair bonding is uh, an attachment between males and females, basically for the purpose of, of reproduction. You'll see a lot of affiliative behaviors. So things like feeding, um, touching, um, mutual grooming, preening, that kind of thing. The relationship is often exclusive, meaning that they don't tolerate or have no interest in having any others participate or join in with that interaction, which means that they can be pretty aggressive about excluding anyone else, and very protective and aggressive in, de in defense of their, of their mate. I already mentioned most of the parrots are monogamous, but again, it might be serial, meaning that they may change partners um, after each breeding season. Uh, here's a beautiful pair of Amazon, blue-fronted Amazons. In terms of how they nest or what kind of a setup they're comfortable with, most of them use cavities found in trees and most of them are going to be individual nests. I already mentioned the monk parrots that are a little bit different because they do the, the communal nests. They are going to defend the nest area, uh, prime nesting sites, cavities are not a dime a dozen. They're a, a very high value resource. And so they are often very territorial of the nest area. And obviously that this is something that can spill over into their day-to-day -day life with people in the sense that if the animal, the, the parrot is actively breeding um, and is trying to set up a nesting area, they may then become defensive of that, of that territory and or nesting area. And I thought everyone would enjoy this. The, these are ringneck parakeets, one of my favorites. Um, and this just shows their nesting cavity in a eucalyptus tree. So this is where they, they would normally hang. And you can see the, the arrangement there, which looks pretty, pretty comfy. In terms of parental care, once the, the babies are hatched, they are altricial, which means that they are born uh, little featherless blobs and the, and the parents have to take care of them. They do that cooperatively, usually with the, the male and the female. Um, feeding and taking care of the young. The little baby parrots need that interaction, a social interaction in order to develop uh, properly socially and also uh, for vocal learning. They need to hear their parents uh, in order to develop their uh, calls. And um, if there's any kind of uh, vocal song involved, they would learn those from their parents. Unfortunately, we don't have, again, uh, a lot of information for a lot of these different species, but the more we learn, the more fascinating it is. There are some different parental strategies. For example, they've discovered that Myers parrots actually have a, a communal nursery area 
for youngsters where the, the youngsters can come together and they've seen just fascinating things like um, object play in, in those communal nurseries. So there is still a lot that we don't know and a lot left to discover about the, the various parrots that, um, that are out there. Juveniles may form their own foraging flocks or, or groups. Um, and I mentioned the object play, which is great fun. You can search for videos of this online. And uh, if you want um, something to make your day and just kind of <laughs> um, give you happy, a happy feeling overall, watch some of those videos with the, with the object play in these young parrots. And here's uh, a picture of, of these youngsters, uh, little guys, um, obviously just been fed. They've got nice, big, fat, fluffy um, or plump um, crops. Uh, vocal communication, they use calls and songs. One of the things, obviously, that's fascinated people associated with parrots over literally hundreds and hundreds of years is a characteristic called vocal plasticity meaning that unlike some birds who learn their vocalizations and songs as youngsters, and then that song is locked in place, becomes permanent, there's no changing it as the animal gets older, parrots maintain vocal plasticity, meaning that they can make adjustments, meaning that one of the things, again, that fascinates us about parrots is that they are able to often learn human um, speech, at least in terms of mimicking or copying that. And that has caused them to um, be high, highly uh, sought after as pets because of that vocal mimicry. I mentioned that that learning takes place while they're in their, in their nest. They're learning from their parents as they are growing up. One of the species specific sounds that they learn is their contact call. And contact calls are for, as they exactly like they sound, for making contact with or maintaining contact with flock mates or um, family members, mates, uh, youngsters. And they are very loud and they carry over very long distances. You can imagine how loud it needs to be in order to carry through a forest, for example. Again, completely normal behavior, um, but you can understand how a parrot doing contact calls in an apartment or a condo or a townhouse um, where that might potentially be problematic. Interesting sidebar or additional tidbit of information. There have been some very interesting studies done in Central America with Amazon parrots that have found that the same species of Amazon, but located in different areas in Central America, actually have slightly different or distinct vocalizations and contact calls. Um, and so this has been defined as and described as di a dialect. The Amazons are able to understand each other, but the actual vocalizations themselves take on a regional flavor, just like somebody from the Bronx compared to somebody who's from uh, Savannah, Georgia. Um, we can understand each other, but we sure sound different. And apparently Amazons um, from these different regions have similar characteristics with their vocalizations, which is just fascinating. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, in these various calls, I would refer you to a fantastic resource, which is the Macaulay uh, Library that is being maintained actually by um, the Cornell Ornithology Lab uh, out of New York. And the Macaulay Library has not only uh, a treasure trove of photographs of different species of birds, but they also have videos and audio recordings 
of different calls of various species. So this was a snip clip that I did the past couple of weeks. And right now they have on file the audio calls of at least um, 6,000 plus species of birds. So, and some um, almost 9,000 videos of different species. So if you haven't checked out this resource, I would urge you to do so. It is absolutely fascinating for most species. I was looking at the parrots, they have a variety of calls. So contact calls, um, um, the sound that they, they make to other conspecifics, to their mates, to their youngsters, it, it is, well, if you're like me, you'll go and you'll start looking at it and you'll realize three hours later that you, um, you were still looking at it, so. Um, Non-vocal communication, mentioned a little bit about this, but all kinds of signals and displays. It's also associated with their plumage, so their feathers and the colors of the feathers. One of the things that is fascinating about uh, various parrot species is that they have a tetrachromic vision. So tetra meaning four, right? Which means that not just like our vision, but they can also see into the ultraviolet range. They have uh, cones in their retinas that are specifically for picking up that ultraviolet um, um, wavelength, which means that they can see fluorescence. And this ability to see fluorescence has been verified in um, approximately 104 of those 350 some species of parrots. I uh, have some examples here to show you, but with the research that's been done, parakeets, because they're very common, right? So it's easy to, to work with them, easy, easy access. So we probably have the most information on parakeets and cockatiels. But in parakeets, the blue, for example, reflects as yellow fluorescence. And here's just some examples of this um, that I hope will give you an idea. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's your yellow, typical yellow green. Um, parakeet, and you can see that in, under fluorescent light that that is reflected as um, a bright, uh, almost um, purple-blue color. So that is what the parakeet can see, again, with those special cones in the, in the eye. Um, so absolutely fascinating. Again, we're kind of blind in that regard. It's not, not our, within our bandwidth as a species, um, but clearly there is additional information and communication occurring um, that we just aren't aware of day to day. Here's some an, a, a additional um, examples of some of that fluorescent. This is actually, I believe, in a kestrel, so I'll give you an idea. How about their learning ability and their their uh, their cognition? Uh, dear goodness, well, parrots actually have the mental capacity of a toddler. They are highly intelligent. They are flexible learners, meaning they figure things out, and they are very very aware of um, the consequences of their actions in the sense that they will, what will increase is behavior that works for them, right? <laughs> they interact with something. If it doesn't work, they tend to leave it be. If it works, they tend to uh, continue to do it. So every interaction with a person is a learning experience, right? They are, they're constantly learning from their environment and they are going to maintain or increase behaviors that result in an outcome it is a value to them. So remember that a positive outcome is based on the perception of the individual um, engaging in that behavior. I think just about everyone at some point or another has heard about Alex and uh, Dr. Irene um, Pepperberg and all of her experience, experiments and research on co the cognitive ability of African gray um, parrots. 
pretty, pretty impressive information and, and stuff. Um, they basically uh, have the ability to uh, label the items and place them into groups or categories. So she did a great uh, deal of work associated with whether or not these parrots could identify a characteristic and then sort different things based on that defining characteristic. So for example, um, learning the characteristics of red and then being able to pick out different things that were red, uh, which um, African gray parrots can do. So it's my understanding that Phoenix Landing actually has a pretty exciting talk coming up in January, specifically on cognition in parrots. And so if you have any interest at all in this area, I would strongly urge you to attend that talk. Um, I will certainly be there um, listening in because it is an area of ongoing research. They continue to astound and amaze us with their abilities. And I'm sure that there'll be some interesting updates about current research in this field. So one of the things that we need to be aware of is just about their ability to learn by their interactions with the environment, their interactions with us. Basically, they are going to, um, there's going to be a preliminary situation or scenario, which is referred to as the antecedent. And that antecedent is going to lead to behavior and the behavior is going to lead to a consequence. So you'll often hear it referred to as ABCs. The more traditional nomenclature for this is a Q response reward interactions. But basically the bottom line is that you want to set up your antecedents to get the behavior that you want and then reinforce it when you're interacting with parrots. Um, you'll hear a lot of catchphrases, but the bottom line is, is that you want to empower those interactions rather than trying to overpower the bird and you want to facilitate the behavior that you want rather than trying to force them to do what it is to desire. I would definitely point you in the direction of Susan Friedman. Uh, she is a PhD psychologist that has um, a website called Behavior Works. She teaches an excellent course in learning theory. And so again, if you have any specific interest in this area, I would urge you to get additional information and go ahead and attend that course. It's, it's definitely worth the time and the, and the money. Um, unwanted behaviors, well, the vast majority of unwanted behaviors are simply normal behaviors that are um, not desired, right? So we talked about like contact calls, we talked about foraging, we talked about their desire to, to be out and about and manipulate objects. And as you can imagine, if you have a parrot in your home and they are chewing on your door or uh, calling repeatedly or um, otherwise uh, interacting with you in your home uh, with those normal behaviors, they may be undesired, but they sure are normal for them. So you need to realize that you get what you reinforce. Um, the behavior is definitely triggered by the setup and whatever happened before the behavior occurred. And so you want to try and set things up to get the desired behavior and then reinforce that desired behavior. <laughs> And I thought this was just a, a really uh, excellent example. Um, here is a picture of an eclectus um, very gently interacting with his, um, the person, um, just a gentle uh, mouthing as they often do um, as compared to uh, the bite that occurred to this poor person below. And so we wanna work on um, making sure that our interactions are favorable 
that we're rewarding desired behavior and that we're minimizing the opportunity for undesired behavior. Um, just another example of undesired behavior, feather picking cockatoos, unfortunately, are pretty frequent. Um, they have a huge need for interaction with other members of their species, they, meaning that they pair bond very, very strongly. They don't have that interaction. Um, when they would normally be spending hours grooming, hours allopreting, hours interacting with their mate, um, instead that grooming can be self-directed and can lead to what you're seeing here, which is basically feather plucking um, from the lack of a, of a place to direct that normal behavior in an appropriate manner. Um, he, these are um, two beautiful parrots from Anne Phoenix Landing. I um, just thought I'd share because they're so incredibly gorgeous. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, some, some resources or some suggestions or recommendations for getting additional information on normal behavior and for expanding your horizons. If you've got this interest and this desire, um, the um, American Federation of Aviculture actually has an online course that talks about basics of aviculture and basics of, of um, parrot care and management. That might be a really great place to start. Um, this is the course that I mentioned from Dr. Susan Friedman, uh, the living and learning with animals. So the learning theory course that I mentioned to you, she does a great job uh, as you're going through it, taking this course of tailoring it to your specific situation or specific needs. So I would highly recommend uh, this one as well. She usually runs the course twice a year in the fall and in the spring. So your timing would be um, spot on in order to sign up in that earlier part of 2024. Um, remember I mentioned the uh, World Parrot Trust. This is the group from which I got a number of those beautiful photographs that I shared with you. They actually have a great series of podcasts where they interview different experts in conservation and parrot care. So this is a great additional resource as well. They've got a number of uh, behavioral um, and avicultural um, podcasts. You can see just from this list, uh, one on housing and enrichment, one on behavior and training, um, health and nutrition, so on and so forth. So lots of information there. This is a, a one that I mentioned to you from Barbara Heidenreich, the one on uh, that has a fair amount of information on um, body language, but she also has information in here on parrot behavior problems if, if for some reason you need additional help. Uh, the LaFaber company also has free webinars and handouts on pet bird and parrot behavior. Lots of, of good science-based information there as well. And then I wanted to do a plug for Phoenix Landing Wellness Retreat, which they do once a year in the spring in Asheville. They cover a huge variety of topics. I haven't met a single person yet who didn't feel that it was absolutely worth their time to attend. Um, and then for those that have any kind of professional affiliation or background, uh, they've been over backwards trying to make sure that we all get continuing education units uh, credit for attending. So there's that double bonus of information, um, credits, and a really good time if, um, if you happen to be able to attend. Um, in terms of written references or access to additional information, these are three that are probably well worth your time. Um, Exotic Pet Behavior by Bradley Bayes has a section, pretty good condensed section on parrots. The Bible is probably Lusher's book on um, parrot behavior. 
I'm hoping at some point here we'll get an updated version of that because there's been a fair amount of, of information that we probably need to go ahead and add into that one. And then Dr. Tynes, Valerie Tynes, uh, Behavior of Exotic Pets has a pretty good chapter on parrots in there as well. Um, as I mentioned, this one's probably the, um, the Bible. That's Lisha's book. This is um, Bradley Bay's book. Um, and this is um, Dr. Valerie Tynes' book. And then last but not least, I wanted to go ahead and let you know about a, a book that I had the privilege of editing um, and also um, writing a chapter. It is on veterinary cooperative care. We do have a section in there on parrots. Um, it is by Dr. Marion Marchalier out of uh, Canada. And she does a really bang up job of talking about good management, careful management of parrots in a veterinary setting. So if you know of any uh, veterinarians that need this information, or if you just want more basic information on how to best handle your parrot for veterinary visits, this might be worth your time um, as well. So uh, with that, um, I'm happy to answer any any questions that might have come into the chat, um, and we can we can go from there. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, kind of along the theme of what you're talking about, some of your books. Um, I was uh, remembering that we've just uh, booked Rosemary Lowe to come back and give another talk in March. Excellent. Um, yeah, she's one of the most prolific uh, yeah, authors yeah. of of behavior of birds in the wild and she's got one book called understanding parrots cues from nature which is really relevant to birds in captivity and she's given us the rights to republish it so it's actually oh, at the printers right now which is really exciting because um she won't be able to travel anymore but she's certainly wise and helpful and yeah yeah a lot of knowledge there absolutely so um I'm so excited that she's allowed us to get her back on Zoom and and uh, get her book back out in the world again. You do have a couple of questions and I'm sure there will be more, but uh, to start, somebody wants to know what you recommend for social companionship or combination with perhaps a Timna African gray. I mean, how do you feel about African grays uh, versus other species and what they feel comfortable with? I think the best way that I can describe it, depending on your on everyone's background, is that the African greys tend to be kind of like the border collies of the of the dog world, right? Like they, their uh, IQ uh, and and cognitive ability is is through the roof. If you if you've got an African grey, then you've kind of well, let me rephrase that. You should commit yourself to doing everything that you can. Uh, to to keep them <laughs> um, suitably occupied uh, in, in order to make sure that you don't have issues or problems with all of these birds. To be quite honest, if it it's a, if it's at all possible to to pair house them with another individual of their species or at least a, a bird or, or a parrot of a similar size that they can they can share space with. Um, that space is being it. the household, not necessarily the cage. Right, just correct. In the environment, yeah. Yeah. We don't I want people that, throwing birds that's... together in a small cage. Yeah. yeah. Oh no 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 no. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no no parrot stuffing, please. Yeah. Um, but so that they they have um, someone else to to share their their environment with. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be, um, ideal. Yeah. We tend to find that the grays like a little bit of distance from each other mm -hmm. versus maybe other species who want to like pile up on each other. Yeah. 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 So just kind of having another gray in the environment, I think gives them some sense of comfort. Like you were talking about being close to a door and being on the job, being stressed. We had yeah. a talk by a veterinarian about feather picking and and he said that he saw like 50% of the African gray population had feather destructive behavior. I yeah. think they stressed more than other species sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
somebody wants to know how many feathers on average will they lose while preening? Um, kind of depends on the stage at which the they're right. molting. Um, I don't know that there's a good way to estimate what's enough or or what's what's normal or what's abnormal. If you start seeing patchiness, <laughs> that's not good. If you start seeing intact um, feathers, that's not good. Um, obviously, any kind of self-injury, that's not good. Uh, and they should be distractible and redirectable. So they shouldn't be so intense on the, on the grooming that they aren't willing to interact or do anything else when that kind of behavior starts to pop up, I start getting, I get worried. Right. And like you said, preening and molting are two different behaviors. Mm -hmm. Preening doesn't necessarily mean you lose feathers, but molting does. Right. We, f we find, I don't know what you've seen is that especially the wing and tail feathers, they tend to lose both sides equal, the same feather on both sides at the same time. Symmetrically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Symmetrically. Right. Which yeah. makes sense from a wild perspective, right? right. I mean, if they still want to fly, right? <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. um, somebody says with 350 species, are there given set, uh, they're common denominators, basically, especially in captivity. I think a lot of the wild behaviors you described are. Yes, that time animal. budget was kind yeah. of generalized. So I think that, that that's generally applicable. Um, I think the behaviors that I described are generally applicable. I think you just have to kind of keep in mind that um, some of the species we have less knowledge than others. So parakeets, cockatiels, we know a lot about them. If you're talking about that papa and lorikeet that I showed you the picture of, we probably don't know anything about them. Right, exactly. Maybe Rosemary Lowe. She's one of the few yeah, <laughs> who seems to know a little bit about that plant, species. right? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could just download her from her brain sometimes. Yeah. So, um, you know, things have changed a lot, especially since some of us have been involved, right? Um, yeah. The whole perspective on hand raising parrots has changed um, yeah. for the better, right? I mean, yes, yes, yes. we're not doing that anymore, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah parent raised but you know i don't know about you but i'm not aware of too many breeders doing it the right way anymore in terms of you know parent raised chicks they seem to be yeah i mean I, from ideally from a behavioral standpoint you would do some kind of cooperative parenting raising right like you the you would try if possible the parents and and the breeder would be interacting with the youngsters simultaneously so mm -hmm. that so that the the baby has the advantage of all the appropriate inner you know co-specific interactions but they're also getting to know people and habituating to 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 people right but i i don't know of a lot of people a lot of breeders who who do that right. and in the wild with some species of birds the, the babies, the youngsters stay with their parents for several years. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And they get so much. I remember there was another study out of UC Davis, which, you know, you referred to, they do some <laughs> great studies about the Amazons who were hand raised versus, versus parent raised. Yeah. And they just, if they weren't, if they were parent raised, they had a whole lot more immunity boosting things that they got yeah. from um, you know, being fed by their parent, there were just a lot of benefits. Yeah. Yes. And, and they are less likely to develop any kind of abnormal, um, unwanted behaviors like the, the feather plucking or the stereotypies with the, right. or they, you know, running up and down the cage and all that kind of head flipping and all that kind of stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. I just wish people were, the breeders were willing to invest more uh, resources into doing it that way uh, that makes the birds more expensive but hey is that such a bad thing you know it's better to have quality over quantity yeah, yeah agreed yeah um 
talking about companionship, socialization, somebody wanted to know about for a cockatoo, an umbrella. Boy, I have some thoughts on that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so companionship, is that what they're asking? Yeah, what is a good companion for a cockatoo, an umbrella cockatoo? Ay, ay, ay. So cockatoos are, are very interesting, right? So they really do form very permanent mate, mate bonds and they, if they, if that need is not met, they have a tendency to, to then do the mate bonding with, with their person, right? And, and that leads to some really abnormal um, behaviors uh, when you have that directed at, at people. So I don't know what your current pol policy is and in terms of working with these cockatoos, but it can be, it can be difficult. You have to try as best you're able to provide them with companionship, although and though some cockatoos may not tolerate it because they choose their own mates. Um, and, and to try and prevent them from becoming overly attached to the individual caretaker often right. by rotating caretakers or right? it's 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 yeah. complicated right it can be dysfunctional very fast mm -hmm. in my experience it's um cockatoos seem to do better when they're around other cockatoos because mm -hmm. that's what they are in the wild as well i don't know they seem to have a lot of dysfunctional behaviors when they're by themselves yeah as you walk out of the room and of course they're going to scream for you scream. to come back. yep right so things like that. I don't know. We see them get a little more relaxed and harmonious when they the few that we have room for here come come here and have a chance to be with other cockatoos. Kind of the yeah. Of course, do you have, have their drama moments? But but in and, general, the dysfunctional behaviors. Yeah. Are, do you have t difficulty integrating with other cockatoos there? Because that no, okay. not at all. I mean, we're pretty careful about no male female of the same species i mean i remember learning that from katie mcelroy who's one of those former good breeders who doesn't yeah. breed much anymore who told us early on that if you put um like a, a male moluccan and a female umbrella next to each other they're not necessarily going to have that same response response yeah but if you put a male moluccan and a female moluccan next to each other you then, might yeah totally different yeah, so I don't know. We're trying to be careful that way. Yep. Um, somebody wants to know more about the flock leader concept. You know, that's that. Um, should should some should one try to establish him or her as the flock leader to captive birds, especially in a multi bird home? No. That's a label <laughs> I have trouble with. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> So no, no, that that was part of the point I was trying to make that the, there's definitely there's there's a hierarchy and natural situation in order to try and decrease your, um, aggression and in order to um, determine who has first access to certain foods or mates or nesting sites. But there's no indication that there's a hierarchy that needs to be established between people and their parrots. And most of us don't don't want that kind of a relationship, right? We want them to be to be companions, and we want to be um, good caretakers for those birds. Um, in terms of making sure that we meet their needs within the limits of of the captive environment, so no, there's not a need to establish um, a hierarchy. Again, you want to try and 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 develop a, a cue response reward relationship, making it very predictable, making sure that they know that um, that appropriate behavior is going to be rewarded, and um, and basically establish that kind of a rapport versus some kind of a a hierarchy situation with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're not wanting to dominate the birds or control yeah. the birds. That's all very old school in that in that regard. Yeah. yeah. You want them to do things because they want to do things for the right reasons, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, somebody who's uh, still asking about companionship for their Timna African Grey and if it makes a difference if it's a Congo or a Timna. Oh, I hear, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, no, I think I think having companionship period is useful. Um, yeah. And I think um, 
as Anne had alluded to, that, uh, that African Greys are often willing to share space, but don't necessarily want to be together. Right. Together. Yeah. Even bonded pairs seem to have a little bit of distance from each other, you know, and I don't know, my experience of seeing birds in the wild is they're very rarely really close to each other unless they're feeding their babies or their mates or whatever. They need to be able to get away from the predator. The breathing room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't lift your wings to fly away from the owl coming to eat you if you're like piled up on top of your mate. So um, right. pretty important for safety. Yeah. Yeah. But we mammals have a different view of that. We like to be touchy feely. Touch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even those of us who've been doing it a long time and know that we still, you know, we, we have to control our hands sometimes. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the tend and befriend tendency, right? Yeah. Got to yeah. touch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I know how I feel if somebody came at me like that, you know, I'd be like, whoa, I hardly know you. Yeah. So, yeah. It's just a hard thing to to get across when we're so drawn to them and their beauty and their magic. So, yeah. For sure. Well, thank you again, as always. For you are very, time. very welcome. You've My been our pleasure. guest. Yeah. Yes. And hopefully uh, everybody, uh, as usual, will take away some one new thing. Um, uh, we need an IABC code, which I meant to do earlier. Let's take something from your slide here. Cooperative. If you're an IABC member, uh, email us and tell us that the special word today is cooperative, and we'll tell you how to get your There you go. <laughs> oh, you have one more question. Not counting breeding situations and excluding some species like parakeets or finches, do you think parrots need separate cages? That's a good question. Separate cages for each individual bird? Probably, because mm -hmm. mm. he says excluding breeding. It, yes. you, it depends. <laughs> right? It depends. Usually, That's true too. It depends. <laughs> so I think I think a lot. De it really does depend on the personalities of the birds involved and the amount of space available to to them. Mm -hmm. it really yeah. does, and um, yeah. Some some are going to enjoy closer companionship. Others are going to want their own private space. Depends on on whether they're you know are they the same species? Are they different sexes? And how how right how all that's going to play out? Yeah. Uh, but but basically, what you're striving for is compatibility and making sure that um, that everyone has enough space to do what they need to do without causing stress. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Julia wanted to know what to do with the word cooperative. Julia, it's only if you're an International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants member where we have continuing education credits approved for today. If you're not an IAABC member, forget you even heard that term. So there are not many of us out there. So, <laughs> But for those that are, we try to help them along with their CEUs. So yeah. Well, again, thanks so much. And, My pleasure. Uh, and for allowing us to record this and we'll put it up on our website. And um, there's always, it's, it's always good to stay abreast of behavior issues. So we get ahead of problems. And Yes, please. <laughs> So yeah. you don't have to call her for a consultation. Exactly. For, put, why put is my parrot business, biting me? Please. <laughs> yeah. Your parrot's yeah. biting you because your parrot said, don't touch me. That's yeah. just that simple. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Then everybody, happy holidays to everybody. Happy it's holidays. December 2023, in case you're watching this a year from now. Uh, thanks to all our volunteers and everybody who helps the parrots of Phoenix Landing and for caring enough about your bird to come to class today. We really appreciate that continue interest in being good learners. That's really important. So, okay. All Bye. Right. Bye everyone. Thank you.